welcome to Health Talks. We've got something a little bit special for you this evening. We're filming from St Michael's Complex in Melbourne and we've been invited to attend an event called Surviving Cancer. It's being put on by the Ian Gawler Foundation and Jess is one of the speakers here tonight, although she's actually running late at the moment and uh, who knows, hopefully she'll be here soon, but we're going to give you some snippets of the evening and some special interviews with some of the other people that are presenting their stories tonight. Uh, I'd like to particularly welcome those of you who are dealing with cancer either directly yourself or in support of, you're here in support of somebody who's dealing with cancer. So it's a great thing to have had cancer. Uh, but whenever I speak, and I would imagine for the others who are speaking tonight, as people who've had cancer and, and have uh, lived through it, we're always conscious of the people who haven't. Uh, and I always have in the back of my mind, if not in the forefront, uh, people that I've helped over the years through groups uh, who really worked at things hard, maybe did a lot of the things or not all of the things that I would recommend uh, and still died through their illness. Uh, and that poses all sorts of uh, questions, but it also poses the uh, fact that the personal connections that were made, people uh, uh, die of this illness. And I guess the reality is, if you look at the statistics, uh, in Australia this year, it'll be something like 120,000 people, probably more like 130 even, that'll be diagnosed with cancer in Australia this year. And of those people, the statistical estimate is that 35% of them, about 45,000 people, will have died within five years. If, if we take what's in uh, You Can Conquer Cancer, um, I think it's really important for people to understand that it's not actually that so-called alternative medicine. Mm. I mean, it, it, it mm. is a real genuine option. Absolutely. But if people are going through, say, cancer, particularly if they, say, they're having chemotherapy, and that makes sense, then chemotherapy is very hard on the immune mm. system. It's very hard on the mental state. The mm. whole works, really. Absolutely. So people need a lot of help to get through that. Yeah, so what you're saying is that it's not radical in any way, shape or form. It actually should be the first thing that you should be doing. I, really. I think so. Yeah. I think we've got it back to front. I think some people try sort of the, the, the medical model as the starting point, mm. and there's nothing wrong with the, mm. the, the, you know, the surgery and the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, mm. if it works for you mm. and if it makes sense. But also, um, I think, coming back to, um, from my industry anyway, why is, why is this happening in the first place and really pairing it back? And you can't always change your past, but you can definitely influence the future. Sure, and sure. so making some smart decisions around that. But I think yeah. it always comes back to, well, what is my body telling me and why is this happening right now? Yeah, yeah. And I think many people I've worked with would see cancer as like a wake-up call yeah. because clearly it's a lifestyle-related illness. Mm. And... For most people, there's going to be major benefit mm -hmm. in changing their lifestyle. And, Everybody. And, and look, <laughs> unfortunately, well, that's right. You yeah. know, I mean, it's really sad that one out of two people alive today is likely to get cancer in their mm -hmm. lifetime. Mm -hmm. And it's a highly preventable illness. Yes. So one of the messages that comes really strongly out of this work is, you know, why wait till you get mm -hmm. sick? Why not sort of stand back and have a look, think about, well, how is my lifestyle going? How can I set things up so there's more balance in my life, which is challenging because mm. everybody's so busy. Mm. But, you know, eat more sensibly, mm. learn to relax, learn to meditate and, and, and allow some of those benefits of the mind to flow into your life. But it's how exciting is it also that people are actually wanting to hear this now and accepting this? And I think, you know, 25 years ago, it was a very different story to what it is today. Mm. And, and, you know, I'm sure you inspired many people 25 years ago, but I'm sure you're inspiring, you know, many many more now and I think that's that's fantastic that there are people that are open and they want to listen and and yep. it'll be maybe their first port of call not necessarily their second yes yeah <laughs> and I think you know really ideally um, <laughs> my dream is that anybody who's diagnosed with cancer would get you can conquer cancer yeah. to learn what they can do to help themselves Absolutely. in that direct way but what would be even better is if the knowledge or the information that's in there was actually going into the schools. Mm. So the kids grow up with this, you know, with a much 
more informed idea of what good nutrition and, really and is. And more respect for themselves as well yeah. because there's sort of yeah. total disregard and, and not that much of a connection nowadays. Well, there is, but, you know, for younger kids, there's not that much of a connection and the ramifications of what you do when you're young actually yeah. will, will shape what happens in the future. And, yes, whilst you can, you can, to a certain degree, change that, there are certain things that you would do when you're younger that could have detrimental effects. Yeah, and so if we think what's the key to all that... It's obviously the mind, because mm. it's the mind that changes everything. It's the mind that decides what you eat, what you drink, how much of it, you know, mm. whether you exercise, how your relationships go, all that stuff. Mm. And so what's, one of the things I take a lot of heart from is the number of schools who are bringing meditation into their, mm. into their classrooms. Uh, because once kids learn how to relax, to settle their mind and get to what meditation offers, which is a calm and clear mind, mm. then they're much more likely to make these good choices. Mm. According to the Australian Cancer Council, by the age of 85, one in two men and one in three women would have uh, been diagnosed with cancer. So uh, I had a fair bit of fear around it. And when the lump was removed in October 2009, the biopsy showed that I had non-Hodgkinson's follicular lymphoma a cancer of the lymphatic system. At my first visit to the uh, oncologist, he confirmed the words that no one wants to hear, you've got cancer. And further testing showed with the CAT scans and things that I had tumours all throughout my body. Um, I tried to be positive knowing that about two thirds of people these days do survive from cancer. But uh, I thought, well, what's the next bit when I was speaking to my oncologist and I wasn't expecting the next three words, which are, it's inoperable, untreatable and incurable. I just felt like saying, well, wait a minute, where's the, where's the chemo and the radiotherapy? You know, don't, isn't that the next bit? Isn't that what happens? Um, but the doctor just simply said that for my diagnosis, the, the way that the recommendation was a thing called watch and wait, which some of you may have heard of. These days, four pillars support my health, and um, I just wanted to touch on them a little bit, and that's basically what I do with my body, what I put in my mouth, how I think up here, and, and how I apply the spirit aspect. With my body, I like to stay fit, and I exercise regularly. I try and get to the gym a couple of times a week, and I've taken up running. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I ran my first fun run of five kilometres and I'm training for a 10 kilometre run in Run Melbourne to raise funding for the Gawler Foundation in July. My kids like to remind me that I'm a middle-aged woman at 47, so I also regularly take nana naps and rests and make sure I get good sleep so I'm well rested. With my mouth, I make sure that only good food goes, goes in and I basically eat a plant-based uh, Occasionally eat uh, a plant-based whole foods diet and I occasionally eat a bit of fish and some chooks from our, uh, some eggs from our chooks. Um, but yeah, I don't have any meat or dairy. I'm hoping that my story might inspire other people that have been diagnosed with cancer. About three and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with a form of lymphoma called follicular lymphoma, non-Hodgkinson's lymphoma. Okay. And I was told that it was virtually untreatable and incurable and inoperable because it was all through my lymph system. Mm -hmm. And I decided to do some research into what I could do to help myself because the only diagnosis I was given was that I had to watch and wait. Yes. Which means waiting for the inevitable, yes. which, you yes. know. And here you are. And here I am. Yeah, so what, three years later? Three years later, Fabulous. three and a half, half years later. And I, I looked into uh, the principles that Ian Gawler talks about, mm -hmm. which is called lifestyle medicine. Mm -hmm. And it involves a number of complementary treatments. So if you're having chemotherapy or radiotherapy, there's many things you can do to help make that more effective in affecting the tumours. Yeah, and help support the body. And that's something that we're always talking about on Health Talks is what you can do to, you know, better your health and, and better your chances with not just cancer, but everything. But cancer is something that, you know, obviously, as we know, you need to be very um, educated and, and diligent and, and commit to. So what, what's that involved for you? Well, it's involved basically changing my lifestyle. So every day I make sure I get exercise in, that I eat well, plant-based plant whole food diet that's low fat as well. And I take a number of supplements that have the evidence behind them that they can help 
support the body in um, thriving from cancer. Yeah. Things like vitamin D mm -hmm. that you've and you've talked about before. Mm. Yeah. And also meditating. Mm -hmm. So I make time to meditate every day. I've got three teenagers, but it's just part of my ritual every day. I get on the cushion. Great. And I uh, do at least 40 minutes. Yeah. And it's really helped me manage my emotions mm. and be calmer mm. and managing the mind. It's been great. Absolutely, absolutely. So I guess, um, you know, for our, our viewers, what's your one message? If you got to, if they only heard one thing today, what might mm. that be? It's, I think, for anyone that has a chronic illness, even if it's something like MS or diabetes, take control of your health. Look at your diet and your exercise because you can do something. And it's... It's just a shame if you feel helpless. I mean, initially you might feel helpless, but there is something you can do to manage chronic illnesses in your body, um, what you do, how you exercise, what you eat, and how you manage your mind and your emotions. There's just so much you can do to stay well and thrive. Yeah, and I think it's also about self-education as well, isn't it? You know, going away and, and researching and, and getting the tools so that you actually know why you've changed in your life. You know, what's working for you, what's not, and really, tailoring that to your individual need rather than yeah. just, you know, a one-size-fits-all approach. We know it doesn't work. Exactly. You become the expert of your own mm. health. And there's so many fantastic blogs and like mm. the Health Channel out there yeah. that you can look at, books you can read, people you can talk to. There's just so much information on what you can do to stay well and thrive. Fantastic. Well, it's a really awesome message, Ruth. Mm. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Nat. Yeah, I was diagnosed with melanoma when I was 23 in 2000. You know, I had a mole on my thigh, it was melanoma. Um, had some more surgery, did a wider excision, had some scans. You're all clear, off you go. Um, yeah, and I was for a while. Nine months later, it made it into my lymphatic system and they found it in my groin. Had more surgery, had all the lymph nodes taken out of my groin. Went on immunotherapy for 12 months. Came out the other end, they whacked the remission rubber stamp on me and sent me back out into the real world. And and yeah, it was in this time, did heaps of stuff. Married my then girlfriend in this awesome low key wedding on the beach. Building a house, my life was mint. And um, yeah, just got back from my honeymoon. And regular tests showed that I had a tumor in my chest. And um, yeah, I wasn't really happy about it. Um, yeah, what do we do? They said, look, it's in one place. Surgery, we'll go in and chop it out and you'll be good to go. And I thought, all right. Um, yeah, had the surgery. It was major surgery. Um, had complications and needed more surgery. And, and yeah, it was tough, you know. Not that I'm vain, but before that, I was kind of like this, you know, I'm a tradie, you know, I was like a fit guy. And the guy that came out of the hospital was this weak, frail little man. What did you do as an individual to, to get well, I guess, is, is the, you know, the real question. Um, I did lots of things, but I, I made a conscious choice mm. you know, to change my lifestyle, to have a healthy lifestyle. Mm. At the time, I was a 27-year-old you know, beer-drinking carnivore. Mm. Like, I was not the healthiest guy. Mm. Um, and yeah, I just tried to do everything I thought was healthy. Mm. I changed my diet to a full vegan diet. Um, you took alcohol, fat, salt, sugar, everything out of my diet. Um, started doing vegetable juicing. Mm -hmm. um, started a meditation practice. Mm. Um, was doing qigong every morning and, and light exercise. And I don't know, just generally looking after myself, you know, yeah. loving myself, yeah, making absolutely. time for myself. Did you love Qigong? I'm trained in Qigong. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, like I, I love it. I still do it every morning. Yeah, I did it at uni. I'm a Chinese medicine practitioner, so I did that th throughout the whole time and it was changed my body and everything. It was amazing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and, and if you read literature on it, it's mm. crazy. Like mm. if you're diagnosed with cancer in China... I know, it's completely you know, different, isn't it? Hospitals. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. completely different. And it's it's frustrating to a degree because, you know, they integrate things over there completely different to how we do over here. That their their, their um, integration in their hospitals is phenomenal. Absolutely, but I'm still I still have faith in the system. Mm. You know, you still see signs of it in the media of you know, discoveries of this and yeah. that. And they're things that 
I or, or people in my situation know. And you yeah. think, yeah, this will be the norm. It might mm. take 20 years mm. and 20 years' time the things that I do will be the normal mode of care. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess from a, a mindset perspective, how has it changed the way you see the world and, and life? Um, pretty pretty stoked just to be alive, mm. really. Um, yeah, you sort of find happiness in the smallest It's almost things. like a new lease on life, I assume, you know, that you've, given, you've been given an extra chance, so you're going to make the most of it. it. It is that. It is that thing of you've been given a second chance but yeah. make the most of it. But... You know, that to a degree is what I did when I was first diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And one end of the spectrum of that is a rabid dog. Mm. It's like life's too short, cram mm. all this stuff into your life and be a madman. And I tried that mm. and it didn't work. And now, you know, I'm aware of how short life is, um, but I'm not crazy about it or scared of it. Mm. I suppose I just just happy to be here and, and don't take anything for granted. But also, I guess, to a certain degree, you'd be looking at your life now going, well, this is actually living. This is how we're supposed to live. Yeah. We're not supposed to live this crazy rat race and, and be pulled from pillar to post. It's it's about, you know, getting healthy regardless. Yeah, and that's why the way I live is cemented for me. It's mm. not this thing that I did to get well. Mm. Like, it's the proof's in the pudding. Mm. And I, I, I feel great. I meditate and feel good. I eat this food, I feel good. I flew down from the Sunshine Coast this afternoon to tell you guys the story of how I completely transformed my life in order to heal my body from cancer. It's probably safe to say that many of you in the room tonight are here because your lives have been touched by cancer. Either you yourself have been given this diagnosis or it's happened to somebody that you love very much. So you're probably all too familiar with that gut-wrenching fear that comes up when you hear those words. And what I want to do tonight with my story, as with all of the other speakers and with Ian and with Ian's book, is to try and dissolve some of that fear and to prove that cancer can actually be a catalyst to not only good health, but to an incredible life. Cancer isn't something that needs to be fought against and attacked. What I've learned is that we can't wage wars against our own bodies and expect to win. Cancer is simply a message from your body that you've got healing work to do. It's kind of like your body giving you one last ditched message to get you to change your ways. Healing can only happen when self-acceptance, self-kindness and self-compassion comes into it. The first thing that I did was go to the Gawler, the Gawler Retreat in February 2010, 2010, and did the 10-day program. And it was here that I learned how to meditate, I learned all about our emotions, I learned about nutrition, and I really gathered all of those mental tools that I knew that I would need to get me through the rest of this journey. The other therapy that I was really led to was something called Gerson therapy. And because of the stubborn nature of sarcomas, I knew that I was really gonna have to pull out the big guns and go for something pretty drastic. And I don't know if you guys know about Gerson therapy, but it's a very intense, uh, completely natural treatment modality that involves loading the body up with all the nutrients it needs to heal and detoxifying it of everything that is getting in the way of healing. And so I went over to Mexico with my mum and I spent three weeks at the Gerson Clinic learning how to implement this therapy in my life. It was 13 glasses of fresh organic veggie juice every day, one on the hour from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to bed. It's completely overhauling your diet to eat three massive all organic vegan meals that have no salt, no sugar, no fat, no spices, no herbs, no caffeine, no drugs, no alcohol. Everything that was a staple of my diet for the first 22 years was gone and replaced by plants and juice. And then there was the castor oil, which we had to drink orally every second day to clean out that small intestines, to give us the runs and make us feel like we have a hangover every second day. <laughs> and then there was my favorite part of the whole therapy, which was the coffee enemas. <laughs> and putting five buckets of coffee up my bottom every single day. 
It seriously is the best part. <laughs> you get 30 minutes alone to yourself in the bathroom five times a day. It's great. And I did all of this religiously for two whole years, dedicated every waking hour to saving my own life. And I did this because very early on in my journey, I called up one of the counsellors at the Gawler Foundation, and I was really probing her about Ian's story and how he did it. And the one thing that she said to me that really stuck with me through all of it was that everything that you do needs to be to heal your body. Every, every single thing, every act that you take, it needs to be in the act of healing your body. Be radically kind to yourselves. Be brave enough to follow your intuition, even when it's really, really scary. And always, always, always be really well. Thank you so much for hearing me speak. And thank you so much to Ian. Thank you. There you have it, four amazingly inspirational guest speakers tonight. The legendary Ian Gawler Foundation, um, they put on an amazing event in this really beautiful venue. We hope you've enjoyed the coverage tonight and make sure that you comment in the section below, share it with your friends and tell us, you know, maybe your experience with cancer or how this can help others. Thanks again for joining us.